This is not going to be a, I don't anticipate it's going to be a massive um, session, but there were two massive dynamics that I wanted to cover because they involve, and I'm just, this is just right now flowing, so that's a good thing. Um, yeah. We cover the rest of the format of the book of Judges oh. because the Ammonite curse, the text for the Ammonite curse is covered by, oh goodness, um, after the downfall of Abimelech and as we have discussed with Jotham's curse, etc., um, that was Judges 957. And then you had a couple of other judges, smaller judges that arose, such as Jair the Gileadite, which is in Judges, the beginning of Judges 10, 10.3. And 10.1 is Tola, the son of Pua. And then after that, you have further disobedience and oppression. Then you have Jephthah, the account of Jephthah, which lasts uh, two chapters, chapter 11 and chapter 12. And then you have the birth of Samson, which is a, a protracted teaching on the Philistine curse. And but we covered that with Shamgar several uh, a couple of months ago. And then after you have the protracted account with the Philistine curse, you have da the Danites taking the Levite and the idol to have their own priest that's not in Jerusalem. And you also have the Levite and the concubine, which uh, ties up with it, it. It mirrors the what happens there mirrors the. Um, oh, goodness, the stuff with Gideon. Because mm. you have yeah. idolatry because Gideon's family was all about idolatry. So you have um, Gideon, his father. In, in, in Orpha and the idolatry that happened there and the golden ephod, then you had the 70 sons, then you had the curse of Jotham, you had Abimelech, mm -hmm. and you had that, that whole sequence of that family that got defiled with respect to idolatry and the priesthood. Then you had the breakdown into national sin, and then you have Gibeah's crime because Gibeah very much mirrors the account of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, something that you should be aware of Sodom's redemptive gift was likely redemptive gift of mercy. Mm. Very much San Francisco, sexual promiscuity. Um, and when you read the when you read Gibeah in Judges 19, verses 22 to 30, it's it's talking about making the hearts merry, and then the men of the city, worthless fellows, surrounded the house beating on the door. Same thing mirror image of what happened with Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, and they said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house that we may know him. Yep, yep, yep. And the man of the master of the house went and said to them, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, here's my virgin daughter and his concubine. So same thing, two daughters. The only difference between this account and the account of Sodom and Gomorrah was that those two men that were going to be gang raped, which happened to be messengers of the Lord, also, they did not suffer anything, and the two daughters didn't suffer anything, even though there was the trauma of them being singled out by their daughter for a gang rape. What you have here is they dealt with violations, and they ended up, there was, there was, they, they were gang raped all night long. Um, and she was dead from, from what happened. So, murder through rape. So, this actually came to pass. This is what would have happened with Sodom and Gomorrah had, that, had the account of Sodom and Gomorrah come to pass where there was an affirmative and the raping and that had happened and there had been no deliverance of Sodom and Gomorrah. So, I think the Lord puts this account here to show us the end result and the end result of of this dynamic the mercy dynamic is when it's in its negative manifestation and you've got the stronghold of self-gratification that takes hold and is completely manifest and it's completely flowered into sin we've got that sequence with that james talks about where he says 
you know, temptation gives birth to sin. Sin, if it when it's fully grown, it brings forth death. Mm-hmm. So the temptation isn't the issue. Temptation doesn't mean that you're a sinner choosing to walk it out and execute on it and violate principles is the issue. And here you have this violation that happens, which breeds the stronghold ultimately of futility, which is the opposite spirit of the Bercy principle, which is fulfillment. So you have this dynamic of Gibeah, and I imagine if there's a similar if there's a similar account happening at Gibeah that there was to Sodom, the redemptive gift of the city would likely also be similar. Mm-hmm. Now, following this, you have the people of Israel from Dan to Beersheba in, in Judges 20, including the land of Gilead, and the congregation assembled as one man to the Lord at Mizpah. So, when the master arose, he took the concub- he took the uh, the uh, concubine, he divided her limb by limb into twelve pieces, and sent her out through all the territory of Israel. And all the people saw it, saying, "Such has never happened or has been seen from that de- from the day that the people of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak." And this came out of the tribe of Benjamin, which was a mercy tribe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Jerusalem, the teacher city, was found in the land of Benjamin, the Mercy tribe. Now, 400,000 men came up and drew the sword, and the people of Benjamin heard that the people of Israel had gone up to Mizpah, place of assembly. And then there's this massive issue with Benjamin. So Israel had this war with the tribe of Benjamin. And all kinds of people got killed. At the end of chapter 20, you have uh, 2,000 men plus another bunch of men. And it says, uh, so all who fell the day, that day of Benjamin, chapter 20, verse 46, were 25,000 men who drew the sword, all of, the men of, all of them men of valor. The men uh, of Israel turned back against the people of Benjamin and struck them with the edge of the sword. The city, men and beasts, and all that they found, and all the towns that they found, they set on fire, towns of Benjamin. Massacring of the tribe of Benjamin at the end of the book. And they made this vow, they swore to the Lord at Mizpah, no one of us shall give his daughter in marriage to Benjamin. Now, Mizpah was also famous or infamous for being the place where Jacob and Laban parted company. Okay. There was a massive breaking that happened between them at Mizpah. There's a massive breaking happening here at Mizpah saying, um, God do to me so, uh, more and so more also if we let any of our sons uh, have uh, or give daughters to marriage to Benjamin and vice versa. And they came up to Bethel, the place of encounter where Jacob encountered the Lord, sat there till evening before God, and they lifted their voices up and wept bitterly. And they said, O Lord, the God of Israel, why has this happened in Israel that today there should be one tribe lacking in Israel? They knew something was missing because Benjamin chose the place of futility to defend these people that had massacred this woman, permitted the unrighteousness and the iniquity to stand. Then they had wives that were provided because they would go and hide because nobody would choose, and people came and danced, and there was some sort of a an interaction where wives came up at random out of the, out of the woods, and they frolicked, and then they had wives selected that way. Okay, now you have the interlude of the book of Ruth, which is about the the romance between God, the God of Israel and the people of Moab. It was a microcosm for for what the Lord wanted to do with Moab. Now, when you open up first Samuel and this is the kicker. 
Who does the Lord select for his first king? It's Saul, the son of Kish, who is a redemptive gift servant coming from the tribe of Benjamin. Mm -hmm. So it's the Lord's intent, even though Balaam's prophecy said the scepter shall arise from Judah, the Lord probably wanted to give political authority to Benjamin, who could feel their way a little bit differently than the other six redemptive gifts. Feel their way to a solution. There was this this feeling earthy, crunchy, just a, I know that I know type of thing, which is very characteristic of the mercy gift. And the Lord was probably wanting to bring the redemption of Benjamin full circle by elevating a member of the tribe of Benjamin to the throne. And... On top of that, he would have figured out a way to have a, the probably the ecstasy of the dunamis, excuse me, the dunamis come from Judah, the scepter, even though there was a legal right there. He would have found a way to move it so that you'd had both tribes bring contribute something to the authority of the nation. Mm -hmm. So it's probably the Lord's desire to bring full redemption and put his seal on it so there was not that seal of futility that was left over from the book of Judges, but a, a massive dose of fulfillment. So you had two um, tribes involved in leadership of the nation. So Judah was ruler? Judah was ruler. Okay. Um, I also missed one part about who did the tribe of Benjamin end up having, getting women from? Oh, I'll go back to that. Cover this dynamic. It says here, oh, I'm just going to read the account. Okay, so uh, Judges 21, now the men of Israel had sworn at Mizpah, no one of us shall give his daughter in marriage to Benjamin. Eleven tribes setting themselves, we're not going to have this, this prearranged marriage. This, ain't, this just ain't happening. And the people came to Bethel and sat there till evening before God. They lift up their voices and wept bitterly. Oh Lord, why has this happened? That there should be a tribe lacking in Israel. The next day, the people rose up, built an altar, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Burnt offerings to say, hey, we're fully devoted to you. And peace offerings to say, um, we have some things that feel misaligned and we need some wholeness here. Peace. When a peace offering is offered, typically it indicates that they recognize something feels off. Huh. Okay. And they want to reestablish the, the bulwark of peace and the pillar of peace and the platform of peace and the threshold of peace. Gets them back to ground zero with the Lord so that they actually can hear clearly from him rather than hear from all of the lusts that they have when they went and served the balls. There was no peace offerings when they were worshiping balls. Uh-uh. And the people of Israel said, which of all the tribes of Israel did not come up to the assembly of the Lord? For they had taken a great oath concerning him who did not come up to the Lord at Mizpah, saying, he shall surely be put to death. And the people of Israel had compassion for Benjamin, their brother, and said, one tribe is cut off from Israel this day. What shall we do for wives for those who are left? Since we have sworn by the Lord, we will not give any of our daughters for wives. And they said, what one is there of the tribes of Israel that did not come up to the Lord to Mizpah? And behold, no one had come to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were mustered, behold, not one of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead was there. So the congregation sent 12,000 of their bravest men there and commanded them, go and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword. So Jabesh Gilead did not answer the call. And all the men were evidently put to the sword. Let me just double check the text here. 
also the women and the little ones. This is what you should do. Every male and every woman that has lain with a male, you shall devote to destruction. And they found among the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man by lying with him. Because those who lie with, when you lie with somebody, you partake in both the good and the bad that they actually bring to the table. Right. Mm hmm you covenant with them. So if those men have hardness of heart, aren't going to come and a woman lies with them, they're going to join right in that hardness of heart. So they're already devoted to destruction. We're done. And those virgins that came from Jabesh Gilead were the ones that were provided. And they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan or Canaan. The whole congregation sent word to the people of Benjamin who were at the rock of Rimon and proclaimed Shalom to them. They had a solution. Benjamin returned at that time, and they gave them the women who they had saved alive of the women at Shabesh Gilead, but they were not enough for them, and the people had compassion on Benjamin. Because compassion, Latin word, compasseo, I suffer together with. Because that com, that Latin C-O-M, means with or together with. I'm Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. And he made a breach because of the behavior at Gibeah to begin with. The Lord, uh, the Lord allowed a different solution for the type of situation that occurred both at Sodom and Gomorrah and at Gibeah. This is the Lord taking an identical situation and handling it two different ways. Then the elders of the congregation say, what shall we do for, our, for wives, for those who are left, since the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? And they said, there must be an inheritance for the survivor of, of Benjamin, that a tribe not be blotted out from Israel. Yet we cannot give them wives from our daughters. <laughs> for the people of Israel had sworn, cursed be he who gives a wife to Benjamin. So they said, behold, there is a yearly feast of the Lord at Shiloh, which is north of Bethel. On the east of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem at the south of Labona. And they commanded the people of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in ambushes in the vineyards and watch. If the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances, then come out of the Benjamins and come out of the vineyards and snatch each man his wife from the daughters of Shiloh. Oh, okay. So those who are not they find angle their way around the bow. Okay. You know what? I, if you reread that text and I reread that text, that might be actually what happened. They finagled their way out of the vow or around the vow. And when their fathers or their brothers come to complain to us, we will say to them, grant them graciously to us. Translation, forgiveness is easier to get than permission. <laughs> yeah, we, we, okay, I'm going to say this in my vernacular. We, we need to pick up some chicks here. Uh, your chicks are wonderful. Can we have them? They're already in love with us. Yeah, honey, I, 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 mom, dad, I bought this this uh, woman that I found in the vineyard, and I stole her while she was in the vineyard, and we danced, and then we're in love. Can we? Can we? Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Snatch each man his wife. Uh huh. From the daughters of Shiloh. Yeah. Translation: Go get a five finger discount on a wife. <laughs> Grant them graciously to us, because we did not take for each man of them his wife in battle, neither did you give them to them, else you would now be guilty. <laughs> and the people of Benjamin did so and took their wives according to their number from the dancers whom they carried off. Then they went and returned to their inheritance and rebuilt the towns and lived in them. The people of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe, and they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. And then Judges ends the way it began. 
Not that this was the best solution. In those days, there were there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This is a, a, another case of of people who are not listening to the Lord doing what was right in their own eyes. Likely, the vision, the 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 word of the Lord was rare. Mm. Because of their foolishness, and when you look at the beginning of First Samuel, when Samuel is called, it says the word of the Lord was rare. Yeah. The reason I wanted to bring these dynamics out, this is one side of it, because I want y'all to, I want y'all and those who are going to see this later to see, the Lord always intended to. And bring healing, wholeness, deliverance, restoration, and reconciliation to the tribe of Benjamin. He shows the illustration when he coronates Saul king. He shows the illustration here at the end of Judges, even though they kind of did some finagling and frustration and cursing and this, that, and the other. You know, they were wayward. And the other dynamic that I wanted to bring out was that Benjamin and the mercy curse, the Ammonite curse. We get to this dynamic in the seven curses where we think, oh, there must be a formula, there must be a formula. And at the very end, in the Ammonite curse teaching, Arthur makes this, makes it abundantly clear that in some cases there is no formula. It's just that the Lord wants to work and do. And with the mercy, there's a whole lot of the Lord working and doing apart from the formula. And if you've dealt with mercies, they lead, they they enter a room, feelings and emotions first, just like the prophet enters a room, mouth first. Do you mean that in the sense that like you can sort of feel them coming before they enter or? Yeah, yeah. What, but what but the, the feel of a prophet, whenever you meet a prophet and you know they're a prophet, one of the ways you can tell is they always have their sword out. Even when they don't mean to have their sword out, there's always this edginess to them and they always have it out. They're eating their meal and in the spirit they have their sword laying across the lap because who knows when they're going to need it. When I first met my prophet portion, he is obsessive with filing and sharpening his axe. He's a lumberjack. He likes it razor sharp. Hmm. And you can feel that. And with the mercy, you can feel the gooiness as they approach. The they approach, and, and the entire room shifts, and you can feel it. And but you, it's the emotions you're feeling. And the prophet enters with their mouth first, like Peter, because they ha always have an opinion about something anywhere, and they're always willing to share it. Mm -hmm. You go have lunch with Arthur, and he's constantly looking around seeing how he can improve the building wherever he is. He's conducted a, bu a building inspection that nobody else asked him to conduct. Oh, yeah. Exhorters enter with their network first. So, yeah. Yeah. So as you're dealing, as we're dealing with this, when we come to the Ammonite curse, it's going to be different than the other six, just like the mercy is different from the other six redemptive gifts. And it's going to be, it's going to bring you to the place where you're brought to the end of yourself because you're looking for the formula and the steps in the Lord. In some of these cases, it's going to say no formula, no steps. I just need to move. And there's a way that the mercy does things in a sequence for the mercy, but that is not always the case. And sometimes the Lord has steps for us. He does has us do the sun mode where we build with principles and tools. And then there's sometimes where he just has us occupy bride mode 
where we listen, where we listen and receive. And he just acts. And in the mercy season, as opposed to the ruler season, ruler season, the picture that Arthur gives, and I'm inclined to agree with him, is you do everything with character and push and you hustle and grind and you push a wheelbarrow full of rocks up a hill both ways on a flat tire. And you do it because, you know, through blood, sweat and tears. Mercy season, there's a whole lot less of that striving. Because there's a good, there's a gooey dynamic of flow. And instead of trying to break or bust through something, you're moving around and going around. And instead of the sharp angles, you've got curves. So there's going to be a little bit of different feel. And even though the Ammonite curse and the Moabite curse are together because the daughters of Lot were the mothers of the Moabites and the Ammonites respectively, and there's boundary violations that come into play with the Ammonite curse like the Moabite curse, there's still this little more bit of gooey, can't try to guess it. Because with, because what happens is, in, in the account of Jephthah, you'll see they're trying to, after they've already secured favor, after they have already secured favor from the Lord, they're trying to buy the favor that they have already secured. Yeah. So let's say you you met a dude, right? You fell absolutely head over heels in love with him. Y'all got married. And you have four or five kids. So your love, as far as you're concerned, your love for him is already secure, right? Like you're set. This is your man. Um, there will be hell to pay if some chick tries to pick him up. It's already secure. You got your ketuvah. You've been on the chupa. You've made your covenant vows before the Ad, before Adonai, and you've got a, a solid marriage with kids. Five, ten years down the road after that, he comes to you and he says, "My parents are willing to give me a, an inheritance and, and whatnot, and I would like to use that as a dowry to secure your love." He's trying to secure something that you've already given him. Right. It doesn't make sense. We try to overpay, overcompensate because because the other party is not secure. And then that kind of causes annoyance and offense and yeah, all kinds of other things. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine for you as a giver, you'd be like, um, and as a as you're a reasonably healthy giver, I can tell compared to a whole lot of other people I've dealt with, you'd be like, um, I already signed the contract, read the fine print, and I'm settled with you. What in God's name are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. In the Ammonite curse, there is that dynamic. And we will cover that tomorrow. But I wanted you to be aware of the Ammonite curse is just is is to the other six curses, just like the mercy is to the other six gifts. There's a little bit of a different flow to it. And then I can also see a response where it's like, oh, you don't think I love you? Well, then how do I prove it? And that puts you in a very unhealthy place, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, inse the insecurity bit that just nags at you. And those things have to be laid to rest because that also can create boundary violations too. It's a little bit different feel of boundary violation from the Moabite curse though. We already established this and you're, up you're uprooting it and destabilizing it. There's absolutely a lie that's being believed there. Yeah, because Moabite is subverting something that's being established and putting something uh, else in place or removing it. Whereas this is more something's already been put, but now you get you're trying to put it back where it already was. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've got a, a a beautiful privacy fence here off to the side, and for example, in in in, ima in my imagination, and I'm gonna put, uh, I'm gonna go and buy this privacy fence that's identical to what I have. Yeah. Or of lesser quality. I need to put a fence there. We already got a fence there. We don't need to, to waste that money to put a fence down when we already have a fence. So when we cover this tomorrow, we'll be dealing with some of those dynamics. And Dorothy, I am grateful that you were able to make it on such a very short notice. Um, all right, so tomorrow, same bat time, same bat station uh, here. I, if I remember correctly, it's six o'clock. And I will talk to you later. All right. All right. Have a lovely day, okay? You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.